Hey Gun Geeks, I'm Destiny from Fate of Destiny Media, and this is my complete review on the SOCOM 2 308 rifle by Springfield Armory. Reliable function and quality components are arguably the most important elements to consider when evaluating a firearm. That aside, there's something special about a gun that does more than just run right. It's entirely subjective. But for firearms enthusiasts like me, there's this undeniable appeal in a firearm with cool factor. The Springfield Armory SOCOM 2 308 rifle has it. History. Adopted for the civilian market, Springfield Armory first released the M1A series of rifles in 1974. The design was a semi-auto-only variant of the successful 308 Select Fire service rifle issued to the United States military during the Vietnam War era. The M14 rifle was first put into service in 1959. In fact, early M1A rifles were made using M14 surplus parts. Up until the late 90s, M1A stocks still featured this vestigial cutout, which on the original military rifle accommodated the automatic selector switch. If you really want to dig back, the M14 itself was the descendant of another iconic Springfield service rifle, the M1 Garand. And that was in service from 1936 through 1957. Ironically, the process of removing the M1 Garand from service wouldn't be finished until 1965, which was three years after the M16 replaced the M14 as a standard issue U.S. service rifle in 1962. By 1970, the M14 rifles were, in, were out of service. And then in 74, Springfield adapted that M14 design to sell the civilian market, which marked the beginning of the successful M1A line that's still sold today. One of the modern variants on Springfield's M1A design is the 18-inch barreled M1A Scout Squad Rifle. This 308 is father to the shorter barreled SOCOM models, the SOCOM 16, released in 2004, and its stocky little brother, the SOCOM 2 released in 2005, both of which have 16-inch barrels. Features. Barrel. In a YouTube video, Springfield Armory's Rob Latham explained Springfield's design goals with the SOCOM siblings. Latham stated that Springfield wanted to make the M1A more maneuverable, as well as provide shooters with more options for accessory customization. Both SOCOM models feature a 16 and a quarter inch barrel, cropped from the M1A squad, uh, Scout Squad's 18-inch barrel, which is itself a reduction from the original M1A's full-length 22-inch barrel. Latham maintains that despite this shorter barrel, the SOCOM models actually handle better their gentler recoiling than their longer-barreled M1A brethren. For the SOCOM models, Springfield develop a developed a unique barrel that meets the gas system to their custom muzzle brake to help reduce the 308's kick and to flatten muzzle rise. I've seen that effect in practice. I fired a, this SOCOM 2 in, an, in all day range sessions without bruising or discomfort. Actually, the biggest complaint that I had after a SOCOM 2 range day is just how heavy the rifle is to tote around. But I'm going to get into that more later. Springfield has fit both SOCOM rifles with six groove carbon steel barrels that use a one in 11 inch right hand twist, which is ideal for a wide range of projectile weights. Stock. One of the disadvantages of the M14 was how its wooden stock swelled and warped in the wet Vietnam climate. Most modern M1A rifles, including the SOCOM models, are instead fitted with weatherproof composite stocks. This black thick stock puts both the SOCOM's overall lengths to 37 and one quarter inches. The M1A SOCOM stocks feature grip checkering here on the faces of the grip, on this fore on it, as well as in the foregrip areas. Although you can't quite see that under, under this rail. There we go. As well as a checkered hinged butt plate. And the underside of the stock uh, of the buttstock comes fitted with this standard sling mount. Rail system. The SOCOM 2's VLTOR or Viltor rail system is kind of a double-edged sword. This sharp looking quad rail expands the SOCOM 2's accessory space to include 13 inches of upper rail, 10 inches of lower rail, and then 5 inches of Picatinny rails on either side. 
This rail contributes to making the SOCOM 2 a muzzle-heavy monster. The SOCOM 2 overall weighs in at 10.0 pounds, and that's without the magazine. Depending on whether you're feeding it with a 5, 10, or 20 round mag, which I usually run the 20 rounders, you could be adding an additional like pound and a half to your rifle's weight. Early Schwarzenegger types may not find offhanding an 11 pound fire stick any great feat, but for those of us somewhat less gifted in upper body strength, the weight starts to cause fatigue after a mag or two. Fortunately, this lengthy lower rail provides ample space for a vertical foregrip, which can help to balance that extra front weight a bit. Or if you prefer, using these two spring-loaded catches, you can remove the lower rail. Popping off this lower rail portion trims seven ounces from the Viltor's overall weight sights. While there's plenty of space to throw a variety of optics onto the SOCOM's upper rail, I've gotten plenty of use out of the SOCOM's stock iron sights. SOCOM 2 features an elevation and windage adjustable enlarged ghost ring rear sight and an XS eighth of an inch blade front sight with a tritium insert for improved low light sight alignment. The weight marking that comes standard with these sights isn't visible on my particular rifle because I noticed that the white marking on this specific test and eval rifle wasn't quite flush with the top of the post and that gave me a bit of trouble with acquiring consistent alignment. So I added a touch of this bright green model paint here, which hasn't affected the tritium, like the tritium still functions in low light, but it helped, um, it remedied that issue that I was having of con getting consistent alignment. Action. True to its M14 roots, the SOCOM 2 utilizes a gas-operated rotating bolt design. As with the M14 and the M1 Grand before it, the SOCOM 2's bolt is right-hand operation only. The action is heavy, but it's still smooth. Trigger. The SOCOM 2 was developed from a military service rifle, and the trigger kind of shows it. According to Springfield's website, the two-stage trigger should break somewhere between 5 and 6 pounds, but my Lyman digital trigger gauge measure, measures it at about 6 pounds and 3 ounces. Travel's fairly short, about a quarter of an inch, and the brake is clean. It's perfectly functional. I've got no magazine, nothing in the chamber, and let me show you. Trigger pull here. Does just what it's supposed to do. This plain trigger guard features a cutout right here through which the rifle safety moves. Click the safety rearward into the trigger guard to engage the safety, and then push it forward out of the trigger guard when you're ready to fire. Magazine. From the factory, the SOCOM 2 ships with one parkerized steel 10-round magazine. But that's not your only option. Springfield also sells 5 or 20-round mags. When they sent me this test and eval rifle featured in this review, they were kind enough to include a 10-round mag and then a pair of steel 20-rounders. So you can see they've already gotten plenty of use, actually. They have a little bit of sand in them from the last time, I, last few times I took them out to the range. I've used all three of these throughout my review process, and each of them has functioned flawlessly. No issues of any kind. Disassembly. I'm only going to take this down to the field strip, and then we'll reassemble it. It's fairly simple, but there are a couple of tricky parts here and there. The only tool that I use is a little flathead screwdriver. And you only need it for just two seconds at one point. First, we have to remove this rail, this lower rail section. So on both sides, there is a spring-loaded catch. Pull those rearward, and then you can pull the rifle or pull the lower rail off. Easy peasy. Oh, and by the way, you should be starting with a cleared rifle. I have already cleared this, but you know, before we do anything else. No magazine, nothing in the chamber. Okay. Now from here, we pull the trigger guard downward. And doing so unlocks it and allows us to pull the, allows me to pull the entire uh, firing control group from the rifle. This lets me pull out the action from the stock. And now we no longer need the stock. 
So I'm going to set that up here. And we'll get to some more of the fun stuff. All right. First, you see this right here? That is your catch to release your recoil spring in the guide rod. This is the only thing that I needed a tool for because in order to get this out, this uh, catch needs to move this way. First, I'm gonna press on this guide rod to relieve the tension on the release catch. Then I'm gonna use the screwdriver to move that tiny little bitty lever out of my way. Now from here, voila! We have guide rod and recoil spring. That's done. We don't need the tool anymore. This is the least fun part of disassembly or field stripping the SOCOM. All right. The facet of this uh, bolt handle that moves within this groove has to be situated within this little recess. Let's see if I, there we go, that little recess. So not quite all the way back, just almost. So when you have it lined up, it should look, it should sit about like this on your rifle or on the action rather. See? Now the tricky part of this is that at the same time, you have to move this upward and outward, which is just kind of a pain in the rump. There we go. Now that that is clear, we can actually remove this bolt handle. Oh, that was a pain in the rump. But now that that's done, we can slide out the bolt. This is easy. There we go. Just wiggle it a little bit. Might need to rotate it a touch. But there we go. That's our, our bolt, essentially. Okay, now it is field stripped. You can clean it from here. If you really want, you can uh, take apart the piston and clean the piston, but I'm not gonna get quite so detailed for this video. Instead, I'm gonna reassemble it. Let's start with the bolt. Rotate it back into place a little bit. There we go. Now making sure that our bolt is all the way to the rear, we want to realign the handle. Okay, make sure that this is sitting within that groove or no, you're going to have some serious issues. You'll never be able to get back together. It needs to fit back downward or back inward and downward. So it should click twice and then action freely. Now from there, our part's done. Put the recoil spring back. Just make sure that your recoil spring catch is cleared out of the way. And when you reinsert the guide rod, this triangle portion should face upward toward you. Now we can use this catch. Press it down to capture that guide rod again. And bam, recoil spring reassembled. Now we can put this back into the stock.
Do you see this little metal lip here? Well, this fits, that metal lip fits right around the front muzzle end of the stock. And the rest of the rifle, or the rest of the action, just settles nicely back into the stock. Make sure your trigger housing is all open and unlocked because this is what's going to lock it into the action. It fits completely vertically right back inside. And then click it closed. Almost done. Now from here, we can reinstall the rail, the lower rail section. Just make sure we pull the catch back and there we go. Safini! Perceived recoil. The SOCOM 2 is a 308 rifle, but it doesn't re quite recoil with a 308 kick. Because the design crops like six inches off of the original M14's barrel length, without including a recoil absor absorbing butt pad, I expected some substantial felt recoil from this like beastly SOCOM. But for the shooter, SOCOM 2 has more bark than bite. The stock's thump in my shoulder was definitely stronger than anything I get from like my AR-15s, but it wasn't painful or uncontrollable, whether through slow or rapid fire. My Mosin 9130s hit harder. Reliability. Reliability is essentially a non-issue with the SOCOM 2. It doesn't really care what the weight of the ammo is, so long as it's brass case. Over the course of testing for review, the SOCOM 2 has chewed through PMC, um, Remington, Winchester, and American Eagle 308. No problem. The only caveat I have is for those bargain hunters who want to make the SOCOM work with that, like, cheap steel case demo. Oh, I had uh, an error. For the first, for a couple of months, the only 7.62x51 I could find was tool ammo. And after a while, I thought, eh, you know, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. So, I picked up a couple boxes to see how the SOCOM would run with them. Twice in 80 rounds, I experienced a serious failure to extract error. In both instances after firing, the casing had expanded in the chamber and had to be pried or forced out. You can see here. That was kind of a time-consuming process. It put a total halt to my range time with the rifle so that I could make sure the gun was safe and then spend five minutes or more trying to work the casing out without doing any damage to the rifle's chamber or barrel. I mean, I'm all about trying to make my ammo budget stretch, but in this case, it wasn't worth it. Just stick to the br brass cased stuff and save yourself the trouble. Accuracy. The 7.62x51mm round can have an effective range of up to approximately 800 yards, give or take, depending on the shooter's skill, the rifle component quality, the optics, the ideal weather and temperature conditions, etc. But I work with what I have, and for this review, that was access to 100 yard range, Iron sights and a steel silhouette, uh, two-thirds IPSC target. Once I started getting a feel for where to hold the sights and how to manage recoil, I was able to reliably land headshots within that six by six silhouette head portion of the two-thirds IPSC style silhouette. The muzzle brake does its job. It tames the muzzle rise, which made follow-up shots easier for me to group. The weight of this hefty rifle may also play a factor in keeping the rifle stable. The only feature I would have wanted to alter a little to eke just a little extra additional performance from the SOCOM 2 would be a slightly lighter trigger. Quirks. When I laid eyes on this test and eval SOCOM 2 that Springfield Armory sent me, my first thought was, oh my god, I have to put some nice glass on this. Fortunately, I had this nice 6 uh, to 24 by 50 millimeter scope handy. Problem was, once I mounted it, that I realized one issue. This particular SOCOM 2 model that I received for Teeny isn't the extended rail variant. So this upper rail ends right here at where, the, um, at where the chamber opens, which is about a foot or more away from where my eye rests um, over the cheek rest. So unless I were to pick up like an aftermarket rail extension, this means that high power optics like this Lucid L5 scope just really aren't compatible with this style of SOCOM 2. Lower power optics that operate it with a less limited or unlimited eye relief aren't so hampered by that effect though. The SOCOM 2 is a heavy beast. 
Although the cluster rail system gives the shooter great latitude for accessory mounting, it adds significant weight to the front end of the rifle. As an average size female, I'm not exactly overabundant in upper body strength. It takes just about all that I can muster to shoot the SOCOM 2 offhand, um, as far as like sustained fire goes. For a rifle marketed as a maneuverable 308 alternative, I couldn't really do a whole lot of maneuvering with it before my arms started to get tired. The ability to easily remove the lower rail definitely gives the rifle a point or two for convenience. I mean, pulling this lower rail section off shaves almost a half a pound off the muzzle end, uh, muzzle's weight. The Springfield M1A Scout Squad rifle, off of which the SOCOM rifles were based, has a longer 18-inch barrel, yet at 8.8 .8 pounds, it's over a pound lighter than this SOCOM 2. One could easily mount a bipod on the lower rail and just shoot it supported, but then one, would, one might argue, why go for the 16 and a quarter inch barrel models instead of the 18 inch or the 22 inch barrel models that Springfield offers? It's just something to consider when you're comparing the different M1A options out there. If this, like, cumbersome quad rail isn't to your liking, Viltor does offer a lighter aftermarket alternative. It's the CASV or CASV14 rail system. The reduced weight of the handguard weighs a total of 13.5 ounces overall, and it goes for a list price of $325. I totally forgot what I was just going to say. Uh, okay. This SOCOM 2 fires the 308 Winchester round, so it will push out way further than 100 yards, but... 100 yards is what I have to work with, and I'm shooting with iron sights right now, so it'll still be challenging for me. Let's send a few rounds down range. Alright, let's get this. Okay. Ready? That's too much fun. This 308 definitely has some kick to it, but shooting prone like this and that extra weight from that rail up front kind of helps absorb it a little bit so it doesn't fly around on me. On that subject, let's talk MSRP. This rifle isn't hot off the shelves. The SOCOM 16 and the SOCOM 2 released in 2004 and 2005, respectively. This means that it's just, it's easier to find them at lower sale prices, if you're willing to look around a little bit. While I have seen them priced at a bank account sucker punching price of $2,500 at a Gander Mountain online store, I found way more examples of gun shops selling brand new SOCOM 2 rifles in the more budget friendly range of like uh, $1,900 to $2,100. I found even a couple of places selling them as low as 1.7k, you know, plus change. Final thoughts. There's just something cool about a black short barrel 308 rifle. The SOCOM 2 retains that classic design cues from its military issued ancestor, but with a modern flair. It kicks hard enough to remind you that this is no light 556 by 45 round, but without being painful or uncontrollable. As customizable as the Viltor rail is, it does have a downside in adding bulk onto the rifle's forend. Even with that extra bulk, however, it's a solid shooter, chewing through brass case 7.62x51 like candy, with a kick manageable enough to shoot all day. Plus, my zebra likes it. <laughs>